I'm Jeff Zeig, and I am the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation. I founded the Milton Erickson Foundation more than almost 30 years ago, 26, seven years ago. And uh, what the Erickson Foundation does is we promote good psychotherapy. We certainly center on the contributions of Milton Erickson, but we also organize large meetings like the Evolution of Psychotherapy. I know at least one person here has been at the Evolution Conference. Anybody else? Yeah. It's like Woodstock for psychotherapists. We, uh, started in 1985, and the faculty then was Carl Rogers, Bruno Bettelheim, Rollo May, Murray Bowen, Carl Whitaker, R.D. Lang, Virginia Satir. And these are the people who shaped the face of 20th century psychotherapy. Every five years, we hold another evolution conference. The last one was held in December, and we had 8,600 people come to Anaheim. It was the largest conference ever solely on the topic of psychotherapy. So we try to find what are the, um, how, how can we begin to discover consilience in psychotherapy? What are the underlying principles that make psychotherapy work? Now, we stand on the shoulder of many mentors, and certainly one of the mentors whose shoulders I stand upon is uh, Milton Erickson. But also, my work is highly influenced by Carl Whitaker, who supervised my family therapy, and Bob and Mary Goulding, who trained me in transactional analysis, and also um, Joan Fagan and Irma Shepard, who trained me in Gestalt psychotherapy. And I have some background in analytic supervision and also some understanding of cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, Viktor Frankl was uh, also a mentor of sorts. I met Viktor Frankl for the first time in 1990 and um, became a friend of the family. And my publishing company distributes the audio and videotapes of Viktor Frankl in English. So I did bring some uh, books from both the Milton Erickson Foundation Press and also from my press, Zag Tucker, and uh, those are available um, in a very nice way, a pleasant way, because we've translated the American prices into Canadian prices, and there's no GST on those items, uh, Victor Frankl tapes, and also items from the Erickson Foundation Press. Um, one of the mentors I wish was here, who we stand uh, on the shoulders of, is Paul Wong. And uh, I know that he's been a mentor for many of you, and, I know how much work, because I organize conferences, I know how much work it takes to organize a conference. And uh, Paul has been a, a wonderful inspiration in making these conferences happen. I'm not sure if I have spoken at all four of the meaning conferences. How many people here have been to all four of the meaning conferences? Just a couple. I know that I've been at three, but perhaps I've been at all four. And uh, I think it's a special treat. I know that, uh, and I hope that you and thank Dr. Wong for the uh, incredible efforts that he and his colleagues put into making this conference happen. And uh, we left information for you on the table about the upcoming conference in December if you want to uh, come to Anaheim and learn about brief therapy. We also left some information about the Milton Erickson Foundation and a handout that gives you some information about the presentation that I'm about to do. I started to uh, talk about um, a phenomenological approach to working with habits. And I'm going to only touch on that a little bit and move more into talking about the phenomenology in assessment and how assessment can lead to intervention. But I'm going to do that more in the subsequent workshop. So really, what I want to talk with you more about is lessons from Ericksonian hypnosis, how we can transmit principles that underlie the induction process in hypnosis that are based in a phenomenological realm and translate them into how we may evolve ourselves as psychotherapists. And I will present some cases to you and uh, orient you to some ideas about hypnosis so that we can understand things through a number of different lenses, addictions. Uh, the nonverbal portion of the presentation. Uh, we, there are many lenses on the floor of the philosophical universe. We can pick up these lenses. We can examine any phenomena, addiction, through many different lenses, biological lenses, historical lenses, personality lenses, um, 
spiritual lenses. And uh, here's an evolutionary lens. So this is your very familiar portrait of the evolution of Homo sapiens and the more modern version. No need to comment on an evolutionary lens for addiction. Secondly, we can look at addiction from a developmental lens. And this is a uh, picture of a caterpillar who's sitting on the leaf. The butterfly is flying overhead, and the caterpillar says, you're never going to get me up in one of those contraptions. Again, no comment needed about the relevance of that to addiction. So the lens that I prefer to take is, uh, I would call a more experiential lens. Again, a lens that has a basis in hypnosis. And by using hypnosis as a lens, rather than a tool, we can begin to examine certain phenomena and be able to understand them in a much more experiential, phenomenological way. So I'm going to offer you a non-induction of hypnosis. This is a very good thing to do after lunch because uh, it's so easy to elicit trans phenomena immediately after lunch. And yet, this is going to be a non-induction. So if I do a non-induction of hypnosis, that means that I would invite you to go into a non-trance. So if you're so disposed to go to a, into a real trance, you will have to do that at your own initiative because it's not my intent to put anybody into a real trance. It's my intent to do a non-induction so that you go into a non-trance. Anybody who is in disagreement with my proposition, please raise your arm slowly and mechanically now. <laughs> And my purpose in doing this non-group trance is to give you some flavor for the experience of what I am trying to talk about, about this strange notion of using hypnosis as a lens and not as a tool. So if I was going to orient you to hypnosis, I can begin by suggesting that hypnosis is a way in which you can just allow yourself now to just sit back and begin to focus. And as you can, just focus inside on what is immediately relevant. You can begin to realize certain sensations. And as you may just take a deep breath, and allow yourself to take another easy breath and just follow gently inside and focus on that certain sensation. You may begin to realize that perhaps you can experience now a warm sensation inside. And as you notice that warm sensation, you can begin to realize that there's patterns of warmth inside that you can realize. And as you discover, discover those patterns inside, there can be changing patterns of warmth that could be part of the certain sensation that you can begin to allow yourself to really realize. And as you do that, you may begin to notice that those changing patterns can begin to evolve and that there are curious ways in which those patterns can evolve and that those patterns can evolve in such a way that you can now have breath and real depth to those evolving 
certain sensations and changing patterns, realizing that as you sit here, you don't have to pay attention to the pressure of the support of the chair. You don't have to realize the backrest. You don't have to experience the seat rest. You don't have to notice the sensations of weight as your body can expectantly just wait, realizing that you have a conscious mind and an unconscious mind, and your conscious mind can attentively just listen to my voice, while your unconscious mind can continue to explore those certain sensations, realizing in a way that you can warm up to that there can be memories, memories that suddenly become very vivid, memories that can be related to those certain sensations of evolving, changing patterns that can be warmth inside. Because as you sit here just listening to me, it would be easy to let yourself head down into a more relaxed and comfortable state. And you could find yourself beginning to have a new tilt to your own understandings. And you may realize yourself, as you can, just take an easy breath and let yourself begin to move forward into the evolving experience. OK, stop. <laughs> now that was weird. What was I talking about? And it was as if the content of what I was talking about faded. And it was weird in the way that I talked because I wasn't talking in any kind of logical and linear and rational way. And it was weird, perhaps weird personally, in that suddenly your orientation and your experience began to change. And that there were physical changes or changes in perception or changes in body orientation that could begin to happen as I was speaking. And so in some way that would seem weird, at that moment that I was offering you an induction, a non-induction of hypnosis, I made the content, the overt content, very abstract. And by virtue of making that overt content very abstract, I was inviting you to experience changes, inviting you to elicit changes from within that would be phenomenological changes. Now, in order to think about hypnosis, we enter a realm that's really familiar to all of us. Because when we go to, for example, a concert, when we go to, for example, theater, when we go to, for example, a poetry reading, we're not so interested in the content. It's not the overt content of uh, Beethoven that's really interesting. And if Beethoven presents the Sixth Symphony and it's the pastoral and it's entitled uh, On Entering a Meadow and he starts bum 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 ba da da bum 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 ba bum bum ba the content is no longer important. And what Beethoven is trying to do is to elicit an orientation, a change in perception, a change in perhaps body orientation, a change in physiology, and that there's an elicitation that's going on. Now, personally, I think that more people have been in influenced by that kind of art than are influenced by the kind of science that contemporary psychotherapy represents, and that that kind of art that is fundamental to hypnosis can be uh, instrumental in understanding an approach to psychotherapy in a different way. 
Now, as I was doing that non-induction and orienting to phenomenology, I was uh, deconstructing hypnosis, and truthfully, that was not a very Ericksonian induction of hypnosis. It was a much more traditional induction of hypnosis in that I was being very structured. And what I would like to do is to deconstruct hypnosis, therapy, and the therapist for just a few moments with the considerations that when we're doing hypnosis, we are influencing phenomenology. And if we could get to that point, we could realize that therapy is about influencing uh, phenomenology, both within the structure of the problem and within the structure of the solution. And that being a therapist, not doing therapy, but really being a therapist has much more to do with the way in which the therapist can alter his own phenomenology, her own phenomenology, in being able to elicit the best from the patient. What is phenomenology? It is a project that eschews the conceptualization for the real in the world for what is real in our direct experience. So we're interested in what the person's subjective reality is and not so interested in what is the object of reality, the implicit meaning of lived experience. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about phenomenology. So just for those of you who are interested in hypnosis, just so that we can get a little perspective, using hypnosis as a model, I'm going to go through this really, really quickly. What was I doing in that non-induction? Well, the first thing that I was doing is I was inviting you, not telling you, I was trying to elicit. And induction is a misnomer because it has nothing to do with the kind of imposition of suggestions that we normally think about as hypnosis. It is more of a model of elicitation. So the first thing that I was doing was I was trying to elicit a change in your attentional processes where your attention could become more internal and focused. The next thing that I did was to offer an opportunity, and again, I did this terribly sequentially, not in a way that I'd actually do with the patient. I offered an opportunity for you to change the intensity of your experience, where your experience could become more or less vivid, so that sensations could be more vivid, or sensations could be less vivid. The passage of time could be more vivid, or the passage of time could be less vivid. And then I offered the possibility of dissociation. And I mean dissociation in two ways. One, that things could just happen. And two, that you could be both a part of and apart from the experience. Hypnotic subjects often say, I was here, but I was there. And so there's that kind of a dissociation, plus a kind of dissociation where things just happen, movements just happen, images, memories just happen. And that there could be a change in social response. So that hypnosis, as I'm conceiving it to you, is not self-hypnosis, which is more akin to med meditation, but a change in the interaction pattern, a pattern of hypnotic communication where the hypnotic relationship changes, where there's a response to minimal cues and a search, intense search for personal meaning in relationship to the things that the hypnotist is talking about. Now, I know that in a field defined as hypnosis, if you experience this component phenomenology, you will say, I'm hypnotized. So, as a world-renowned expert on hypnosis, who has taught hypnosis in 40 foreign countries, I'm going to say to you clearly, hypnosis doesn't exist. And the charming part about hypnosis not existing is that it's just a construct of convenience. It's a construct of convenience because we need a way of describing that state that we get into when we change our attention, change our intensity of experience, dissociate, and respond differently in this context. So although hypnosis doesn't exist, I don't believe that depression exists or curiosity exists or for that matter happiness exists or that therapists necessarily exist, that these are constructs of convenience and so what I'm doing now is a radical deconstruction, 
deconstruct hypnosis, deconstruct uh, therapy, deconstruct the goals of therapy, so that we can begin to reconstruct them into states. This would be a model of states. And also, this has to do with the fact of human plasticity. You know, there's an awful lot about neuroplasticity that is going on now where we, is, where we understand that the human brain is plastic and can respond and grow neurons in a way that we never understood before. Well, hypnosis presaged that because hypnosis is about plasticity. It's about how we can be plastic in our perceptions and in our relationships. And understanding that plasticity is part of understanding the phenomenology of trance. So just to orient you as quickly as I possibly can, um, in this states model, thinking about depression, we could say that depression doesn't exist. That depression itself is just a construct of convenience. And yes, if you looked at this from a biological standpoint, you would pick up that lens and you would say depression is a neurological disease that has to do with uh, the receptors and the amount of serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine that you find in the receptors. But taking a phenomenological lens, we can say depression doesn't exist. If you do these things, if you're internal, in the past, negative, hopeless, uh, not okay existentially, if you take the social role of being a victim of life, or if you do any combination of those things, you will say, I'm depressed. Now, the cheerful part about that is that happiness doesn't exist. Because happiness is just a construct of convenience, and it so happens that if you take depression and flip it, you can have happiness. So if you're external, present, active, positive, engaged, and visual, you can be happy in addition to some combination of being okay existentially, acknowledging your accomplishments, and portraying yourself in the social role of being a victor rather than a victim of life. So it would be hard to change depression. It would be hard to access happiness. It would be hard to go into hypnosis. If I sat and with a patient, I said, okay, go into trance, it would be tantamount to saying to a depressed patient, okay, stop being depressed. Or even worse, saying to a depressed patient, okay, be happy. Because we can't change our states in that kind of directed way. So if we deconstruct the idea of hypnosis, if we deconstruct the idea of depression, if we deconstruct the idea of uh, happiness, we can begin to do the component parts that will add up into the sum total of the state that we're trying to elicit. Now this makes me challenge you to start thinking about addiction. Let's say that addiction doesn't exist and it is just a construct of convenience. And that if a patient comes in with a, a problem of anorexia or a bulimia, or the patient comes in with a heroin or a drug addiction or a, an overeating addiction, we say, this addiction doesn't exist. The addiction is just a construct of convenience. It's just a way that the patient has of getting a handle on their experience so that they can communicate it as a tote because we need to group things to communicate them as one thing, but when in actuality they're not. So it's very hard to change addiction. But if we can think what is the underlying phenomenology and how can we create situations that will help people to elicit changes in the component phenomenology, the sub-phenomenology, then we can be Rogerian. And we can suspect that people will then begin to be health-seeking and begin to change patterns. And all that we need to do is to tinker a little bit and make some small changes in the internal system. That happiness is a system that of number of components. And if we elicit systemically significant enough components, happiness appears. And depression is a system. 
internal and social. And if we can begin to disrupt some of those patterns, we can change the characteristic. So that is the Cook's tour to phenomenological thinking. And I would invite you, and we can take a look at this in the workshop, to think about what is a phenomenology of addiction and what kind of classifications can we use to understand phenomenology? How can we deconstruct immediately the patient's problem? Now, the patient knows they're addicted. They're going to say they're addicted, but we don't have to think that way. The patient says, I'm depressed, but we don't have to think that way. We can begin to deconstruct into elements that can be systemically altered. And our mentality will be, what is a minimum change that will alter the system? Well, one last piece, which is therapists don't exist. At least therapists shouldn't exist because therapists should be a construct of convenience that's a composed of a certain phenomenology. And if you do one phenomenology, you'll be one kind of therapist. And another phenomenology, you'll be another therapist. So if you want to be a traditional therapist, you can be empathic, attentive, accepting, quiet, educational, present, warm, placid. If you want to be a traditional hypnotist, you could be commanding and dynamic and suggestive and colorful. If you want to be an Ericksonian therapist, you might want to be experiential and dramatic and acceptant and flexible and metaphoric in your approach. And it would be very good if we got out of that horrible mentality. And I just feel so bad for the field that that mentality of the therapist being invariant which is where psychotherapy began with Freud, just permeated the field that somehow the therapist would have to be this invariant force in order for the psychoanalysis to happen. Not to say there's anything bad about psychoanalysis, and I can afford it, I would do it myself. But um, the mentality of the therapist just sitting there in the traditional therapist's posture how do you feel about that? <laughs> that? It's just beyond comprehension that that uh, fixed idea permeated our field and that the therapist couldn't use his body or changes in his voice or changes in emphasis and tone and movement in order to elicit changes in mood and perspective. And could you imagine Richard Burton doing a line from Hamlet sitting there and saying, to be or not to be, that is the question. He wouldn't be doing anything that was uh, the nature of his art, which was to elicit a change in mood and perspective, not fill the left hemisphere with facts. And yet in psychotherapy, we try to fill people's left hemisphere with facts. And so the kind of Ericksonian orientation that I represent is a way of thinking differently. It's modeled out of hypnosis, and it's my belief, maybe my delusion, that if I can orient you to the phenomenology of hypnosis, you can better understand the kind of cases that I'll present to you next to give you the flavor of an Ericksonian orientation and how we might approach the problem of addiction from an Ericksonian point of view. In this phenomenological perspective, we have four ways of intervening. One, we can disrupt the phenomenology of the problem. If you can create a systemic disruption, that may be significant. Two, we can elicit happiness. Because, for example, every depressed person has years of experience at doing all of the components of happiness. They exist. It's just a matter of eliciting them. And if you elicit enough of those, you may change. We could think of hypnosis as a bridge between the land of the problem and the land of the solution. If the patient comes in and they're in their problem state, addiction, depression, anxiety, then you can move them into the hypnosis state. You have made, perhaps, a systemically significant intervention. They've changed your state. If you can change your state once, you can change your state twice. And also, we can think about the therapist as a bridge between the land of the problem and the land of the solution. So it's not only through the 
procedure of hypnosis, but also through the person of the therapist, that change can happen. Cases. Where we were traveling to, and yet feeling compelled to give you this orientation before we could get to the cases. So a couple comes in to see Erickson. And the problem that the couple brings is the wife's alcoholism. And it seems that this is a vicious problem and not being easily solved. And I don't know why, but Erickson decides he's going to see the couple. And the husband is bitterly complaining about the wife's alcoholism and about the wife's little hobby. The wife's little hobby is that she spends all weekend long in the garden and as she's gardening, she takes drinks from a hidden bottle of whiskey. Now, the husband has counseled the wife, has confronted the wife, has criticized the wife, and has explained to the wife in no uncertain terms that her little hobby <coughs> excuse me, is bad for her and bad for the relationship. But the wife continues her little hobby with impunity. Now, as Erickson is interviewing the couple, he finds out that the wife has a complaint because the husband has a little hobby. And the husband's little hobby is that he spends all weekend long sitting in the same room in the living room, reading, according to the wife, dusty old books, dusty old magazines, and dusty old newspapers. Now, the wife has confronted the husband, has counseled the husband, and has criticized the husband, explaining to him that his little hobby is bad for his health and bad for the relationship. But the husband continues his little hobby with impunity. Erickson, in the initial interview, finds out that the couple has a camping bus, but they haven't used it in years. And he also finds out that the couple has an aversion to fishing. They hate fishing. Now, how are we going to approach that case? Now, we could approach that case by saying to them correctly, giving them information in their left hemisphere, excuse me, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you are engaged in a hostile, dependent relationship. And if we said that to them, we would be absolutely right, and we would be giving them a concept that would be true, real, but would it be helpful in eliciting a change in their state? Excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you are engaged in an escalating symmetrical conflict. It would be true. Excuse me, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, but I think that if you reflect back on your adolescent rebellion, children being viruses sent out by their family of origin to mindlessly replicate the pattern in the family of origin, you would realize that you are replicating your adolescence in your relationship, and your relationship cannot possibly progress from this adolescent stage into a mature relationship. We might be right, but would we be really be effective in helping Mr. and Mrs. Smith change their pattern? And certainly, it wasn't what Milton Erickson did. What did Milton Erickson do? He did something that we couldn't do in today's ethical climate. He said to Mrs. Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, go out and buy a bottle of whiskey. Take that bottle of whiskey and bring it inside the house. When Mr. Smith comes home from work, he has one hour, and only one hour, to find the hidden bottle of whiskey. If he doesn't find that hidden bottle of whiskey within one hour, you can drink with impunity inside the house. Now, Mrs. Smith loves this assignment. <laughs> and she finds a place to hide a bottle of whiskey that no man would ever find within one hour. But then somehow, after a few days of doing that, it's just not fun anymore. And they come back to Erickson for a second session. And Erickson looks at them critically and counselingly and confrontively, and he says to Mr. and Mrs. Smith, go fishing. <laughs> and they say, no. Go fishing. Well, we told you we hate fishing. You will go fishing. What are you talking about? We don't want to go fishing. We don't like fishing. Go fishing. We're not going fishing. You will go fishing. We are not going fishing. Go fishing. Why? Well, it's the only proper therapy for you. 
Mr. Smith, if you're in a little boat in the middle of the lake, there's no possible place for dusty old books, dusty old newspapers, and dusty old magazines. Mrs. Smith, if you're in a little boat in the middle of the lake, there's no possible place for you to uh, hide a bottle of whiskey. It's the only proper therapy for you. Go fishing. So what did Mr. and Mrs. Smith do? They act with impunity. They go camping. <laughs> they dust off their camping bus that they haven't used for years. They go camping. In the process of going camping, they suddenly begin to discover a new little hobby. And their new little hobby is using their camping bus and exploring Arizona. And in the process of discovering their new little hobby, they start interacting. And then gradually, he gives up his little hobby and she gives up hers. Now that is called uncommon therapy. But what makes that uncommon is that we're not basing it on the same kind of presuppositions that psychotherapy is normally based on that you need to uh, mediate things through the left hemisphere in order for people to change. It's based more on Beethoven, like presenting a theme and uh, asking people to elicit some change in their orientation by virtue of the experience that they have. And so, uh, unfortunately, this is uh, something that's uh, been criticized as being manipulative or something that's criticized as uh, being um, uh, you know, ethically suspect or being untraditional as far as psychotherapy is concerned. But what makes it untraditional is that you're just not using the same presuppositions that, ground, that are grounded in the history of psychotherapy, which, by the way, was founded in 1885 when Freud became first interested in the psychological aspects of medicine. Case number two, my second favorite Milton Erickson story, because it's an example of Erickson doing therapy with me. This is about 1976, maybe. And I am still, uh, when I met Milton Erickson in 1973, I had a master's degree and I had my license as a marriage family counselor in California. And then I went on and got my PhD. About 1976, I'm at the end of my PhD coursework, and I am teaching undergraduate psychology, Psychology 101. And I'm a pipe smoker. And I am the young psychologist pipe smoker. And I have a pipe rack, and I have beautiful you know, pipe tool, and beautiful lighter, silver lighter, and I have a leather pouch and custom blends of tobacco, and I am the young psychologist pipe smoker. And I'm visiting Milton Erickson, and I'm sitting out in his backyard smoking my pipe, and he's in a wheelchair wheeled by Mrs. Erickson to see a patient, and he sees me smoking a pipe, and then I come in for my session to, uh, as a student, and Erickson begins the session by telling me a story. And it's a story about a friend of his. And the friend was a pipe smoker. And the friend was awkward because the friend didn't know where in his mouth to put the pipe. Should he put the pipe in the center of his mouth? Should he put the pipe in the right corner of his mouth? Should it be one millimeter away from the left corner? Should it be one centimeter away from the center to the left of his mouth? He was awkward. And the friend was awkward because he didn't know how to blow out the smoke. Should he blow the smoke down? Should he blow the smoke into a diffuse way? Should he blow the smoke up and to the right? Should he blow the smoke to the left? He was awkward. And the friend was awkward because he didn't know how to hold the pipe. Should he hold the pipe with his right hand? Should he bend the wrist? Should he support the bowl with his fingers? He was awkward. I'm thinking, why is he telling me this story? I've smoked the pipe for years. I'm not awkward. And the friend is awkward because he doesn't know how to light the pipe. Should he use a match? Should he use a lighter? Should he use a wick, mat, a wick lighter? Should he use a butane lighter? He's awkward. And the friend was awkward because he doesn't know where to put the pipe down. Should he put the pipe on the floor? Should he hold the pipe in his hand? Should he uh, put the pipe on his lap? He's awkward. I swear to you, this went on for one hour. 
Now, Erickson is a very slow speaker because of his infirmities, but also he was waiting. He was waiting until he saw a hypnotic response. Like, and there must have been a moment in which I unconsciously started to nod my head. <laughs> and at that moment, it was as if he thought, okay, Jeff got it. A few days later, I'm driving back, because I wasn't living in Phoenix at the time. I'm living in California at the time. A few days later, I'm driving back, halfway between, Calif between Phoenix and San Francisco, an intersection in Bakersfield, California. I look up at that intersection, and I say to myself, I, I don't want to smoke a pipe again. <laughs> and consciously, I didn't want to smoke. And unconsciously, I didn't want to smoke. And I quit. And it was my choice. And it was my accomplishment. And it was my victory. All that Erickson did was to tell me a little story. And believe you me, he had a wonderful time telling me that story. <laughs> and I had an intelligent enough unconscious mind to uh, pick up on the message. But he didn't try to mediate things through my left hemisphere. He didn't say to me, Jeff, you know, you've uh, got lots of good motivations and there's lots of reasons that you want to be healthy. He didn't try to do anything that was connecting things by mediating them through my information processing system. Not much time. Another quick case. Uh, go to a case of Barbie. Just one, one more Erickson case, I think. So I'm visiting Erickson. He's working with an anorexic girl. And I didn't actually get to sit in on the sessions, but I was there and saw the mother and the daughter come in and uh, actually was there when um, Erickson, uh, next to the last daughter, got married. And I was invited to the family wedding, which was incomprehensible to me because I didn't know the family that well. And it was Erickson's strange way of bringing people into his family, reparenting them. So I went to the wedding and saw her eat a piece of chocolate cake, uh, a piece of wedding cake, and remembering how delighted the family was that Barbie ate, actually ate the wedding cake because she was invited to the wedding. So she and her mother uh, uh, come, and eventually her father comes. And uh, she's pitifully uh, anorectic. And Erickson starts to orient her to the particular addiction that she has. Um, and uh, he starts to, or non-addiction, she's not eating. And uh, he starts to uh, be interested in her health. And he's a physician, so he can be interested in her health. And he can be interested not only in her mental health, but he can be interested in her physical health and her dental health. And as part of her dental health, he can agree, she can agree that he can be interested in helping her with her dental health as long as she's absolutely sure to promise that she will not swallow anything. And of course, she agrees that she won't swallow anything. And he knows that she's a very dutiful and responsible person. And then he starts to do this hypnotic kind of orientation where he talks with her about his father in the Old West and being in a mining town and how the supply train would come for not for a, a very sparse amounts of time and how food had to be prepared. And he starts interspersing ideas about food and sociability. And he starts interspersing emotions and takes this uh, young girl through this range of emotions, and she's so emotionally limited. And a psychiatrist who happened to be in the room at the time left the room in a sweat because he said, my God, Erickson took him through every possible emotion. And he was just exercising from the inside out all of her emotions. And then he starts to uh, criticize the mother and get the mother uh, interested in the fact that she needs to gain weight and that she's been a very bad model because she weighs exactly the same as she did when she was married. And uh, that um, the mother needs to do some things. And so then uh, Barbie and her mother are going off and they're taking a uh, little holiday and they're going to the north of Arizona. And Erickson suggests that she is to use the mouthwash that he prescribes because he's concerned about her dental health. And she agrees to use that kind of mouthwash. And then Erickson introduces what the mouthwash will be. And the mouthwash will be cod liver oil. 
And so Barbie will have to rinse her mouth with cod liver oil. Now Erickson says if you put cod liver oil in your mouth, you're going to want to put anything else into your mouth to get rid of that horrible taste. And Barbie on this excursion. And conveniently, her mother forgets her promise to do what was needed to help her daughter as far as gaining weight herself. And so then they come back, and Erickson says, well, you've uh, committed an offense, and I have to punish you, and so you'll have to accept the punishment. And so then Erickson gives them the punishment. And the punishment is that they are to make a cheese sandwich. But the cheese sandwich is a slice of bread with two pieces of cheese on the outside. It's a kind of reversed cheese sandwich. It's two slices of cheese with bread in the middle. And Barbie has to eat the cheese sandwich because she's committed an offense. And her mind knows that she's being punished because she has to be punished for committing the offense. But her body knows this is nutrition. But her mind knows that this is punishment. Now that is uncommon therapy, setting up a condition over time, whereby change will happen and not mediated by the conscious mind. Oh, not much time. Mm, I wanted to uh, mention a little bit about a couple, but I don't think that I have the time. Well, I'll do it, try it anyway. Okay, uh, man calls me, says that he wants to stop smoking. I say, okay, well, is there anybody else in your family who's a smoker? His wife's a smoker. I say, well, it's a two-for-one special. Does your wife have any orientation and interest in stopping smoking? Yes. Okay, so then uh, please bring her and, um, you know, come into the session, and we will do this hypnotic therapy to help you to stop smoking. So the couple comes in, and they're in therapy with somebody else, and they're seeing me as an adjunct to the kind of marital counseling they're, ha they're having. And this is a very working class couple. The husband comes in in his work clothes, and he's gregarious and just upbeat. And the wife comes in, and she looks like a, a motorcycle girl, like a biker chick. And she's got black boots and black uh, jeans and a white shirt. She looks tough. And both of these people have been polydrug abusers, and they are working a program. And so then we start talking, and uh, the wife starts uh, to talk about pain and the fact that she suffered chronic pain. And I start to listen to that, and then I start to put that aside, because she's got some very good strategies to deal with pain. And then I um, start to ask them about the urge to smoke. What's the urge to smoke like? And neither of them can describe the urge to smoke. Well, you can describe anger, you can describe happiness. What's the urge to smoke? Describe that urge to smoke. And we spend time, and neither one of them can get exactly what it is. But, and that becomes interesting to them, a little bit like Erickson, with the idea of dividing this uh, pipe smoking into its component parts and losing some of the integrity by dividing things into its component parts. And then I say to them that the idea that the urge is actually a pain. And they can accept the idea that the urge is a pain. And that they have ways of dealing with pain. And that couples, then I segue, that couples have a special language. And that the special language that couples have is not comprehensible, even to a therapist, and couples may say things to each other and have this special language, and even a trained listener might not know what that special language means. And then I suggest to them that, they, that their urge to smoke really isn't an urge to smoke, that it's actually a pain. And it's really a pain in many senses. And that they can say to each other, I have that pain. And if they say to each other, I have that pain, it will mean that they have an urge to smoke, which they really can't define and don't know exactly what it is. But if they say to each other, I have that pain, then they can each have ways of helping the other to deal with the pain. Now, the wife, as it turns out, wants to get really close to the husband. And the husband, for all of his glib sociability, is actually a very uh, distant kind of person underneath. So I suggest to the husband that if he has uh, any urge to smoke, 
and says to the wife, I have that pain, then what his wife will do is that she will immediately hug him and get close and say all of these tender words of affection. Now he's sort of nodding his head and shaking his head at the same time because he knows that something's right about that, but something's also wrong about that. And I suggest to the wife that if the husband says, I have that pain, that the husband will immediately give her time alone. And she's sort of nodding and shaking her head at the same time because she knows that's right, but it doesn't quite make sense. And then I say to the husband that I have a second assignment for him, that he is to lie and cheat three times a day. And this is incomprehensible to him. What do you mean? Well, I say there's a couple of ways of lying and cheating. You can be honestly honest or you can be dishonestly honest. For example, you could say that I've done the chores that when you actually haven't, and that would be uh, being honestly dishonest. But you could be dishonestly honest, and you could say that I haven't done the chores when actually you have. And this is completely confusing to him, and we agree that as long as it has nothing to do with substances, he will lie and cheat three times a day. At the end of that time, she will catch him for when he's lying and cheating. But when he used to engage in substance abuse, he always lied and cheated. So he said, I'm going out for a beer, and then he went out for hard drugs and uh, uh, different pharmaceuticals and, uh, and hard alcohol. And then I said that I had another therapy for him, and uh, that the therapy to him, for him was an awareness exercise. And the awareness exercise was now I'm aware of, 54321, auditory, visual, tactile. And that he would go through this exercise, he was a military person, and that he would go through this exercise and it would be artillery that he would use to fight off the urge if it happened to him, and it would be in the spirit of lose your mind, come to your senses. And that he might even get a little high by virtue of uh, the exercise. And then I said, well, we don't have more time, so please come back tomorrow for the hypnosis. And they would come back for individual sessions, each half hour sessions, with the implication that they would be smoke free for the next 24 hours, which they were. So the wife came in for the session, and she said, announced, I stopped smoking. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, when I stopped using drugs, I woke up one morning, I said, I'm not using drugs anymore. I didn't, I never have, I stopped smoking. I said, oh, the, you know, did you say to your husband, I have that pain? She said, no, I, I didn't need to. I said, oh, that's terrible. She said, why? I said, well, you know, your husband's a little bit of a baby. She said, well, my husband, he's a complete baby. I said, yeah, if he sees how easy it is for you to be decisive, he may unconsciously do some things that are inadvertent that bring back this uh, habit. So you need to say, I have that pain, even exaggerated if you feel it just a little bit, you need to say it a few times a day so that he knows that you're going through some withdrawal and that he can be there to help you. And uh, then I start uh, working with her and uh, do a little hypnosis, and the hypnosis with her is a kind of a developmental process reinforcing what she had just accomplished. The husband comes in for his session, and he's laughing. And I said, what? And he said, well, I've been driving around the city just laughing, thinking, why did you tell me to lie and cheat? Uh -huh. And um, I say to him, well, please tell me, did you say to your wife, I have that pain? He said, no, I haven't had to. I haven't had any, any uh, discomfort. I said, that's terrible. He said, why? I said, well, you know, your, your wife, she's like a mother. He said, oh, my wife, she's a complete mother. She mothers everybody. I said, yeah. And she needs to know that she can use that feminine part of herself. So you have to say a couple of times a day, I have that pain whether or not you feel it. And so he uh, agreed. And then I did a hypnosis with him. And the hypnosis with him was another piece of artillery that he would use. And he would use that piece of artillery to further fight off any urge that might happen to him. I taught him a self-hypnosis technique. With a, uh, another patient, it was more strategic therapy. This patient has now lost a body. She has lost about 120 pounds over the course of a, a little more than a year. And this, the therapy with her, very little hypnosis. One of the techniques was we had to have a food fight. And so she and her roommate were fighting with food. And then I had her playing with her food. Because of the family injunction, you couldn't play with her food, so we had her playing with her food. 
And she was doing all kinds of things, building castles with the food and making uh, sculptures with the food. And she, before she ate, she had to play with her food. And then we had her divorce her food. Now, this woman was eating literally six dozen Krispy Kreme donuts at one sitting with two gallons of milk. So this was a horrible addiction. So she wrote up this divorce decree. And this is her divorce decree. And so she divorced her food. She went down with a bunch of Krispy Kreme donuts, went down to the courthouse, filed this decree, fictitiously, of course, left it at the courthouse, and uh, it you know, has her name and the case number and that she was divorcing food. And uh, it's signed, Krispy Kreme, Judge of the Superior Court. <laughs> and um, in this uh, orientation, then we had her marry healthy eating. So we had a marriage ceremony where she would marry healthy eating as part of uh, the therapy. And then I had little phrases that I would give her on cards, like, eat wise, full of knowledge. And so she was carrying around this little sack of, uh, of curios over the course of the past year, little totems, little objects uh, that she continued to carry around to keep her mindful. Now, where I was trying to get to that I never got to over the course of the presentation is what I have for you on the handout, which is these learnings from hypnosis. And these are the principles that underlie those cases and uh, there's a handout, I hope enough of them on the tables. If your table doesn't have enough, just maybe look at one of the other empty tables and you'll see those handouts. And uh, these principles like you can change your state, you can utilize the patterns of rebellion that the couple has, you can create experiences that catalyze change, you can have a goal in mind and orient towards the outcome, you can elicit change, not induce. You can create a process whereby change happens. You can speak the patient's emotional language, promote change within a, within a systemic concept. You can use drama, individualize the treatment. Those cases cannot be repeated. There's no set script. You can do the opposite of the prevailing norm and make it, make it work. If the prevailing norm is you need to analyze and have information, you can just do a whole therapy based on amorphously giving people experiences. And you can make small changes that will snowball into constructive ways. So um, I come from the belt and suspenders theory. The belt and suspenders theory is if you have both the belt and a suspenders, you have less chance of losing your pants. So uh, I'm a little overprepared for the presentation today and uh, um, lots of uh, uh, information. I can you know, continue to answer questions and engage in some dialogue and talk more about these underlying principles. I, uh, in, in the workshop, I invite you to uh, look into the Erickson Foundation, learn some of the things that we're doing. I uh, brought all kinds of propaganda, including issues of a newsletter of the foundation. You can get on our mailing list and receive propaganda for the rest of your life. I would be glad if you, uh, you know, took these uh, conference flyers and perhaps posted them at your house of worship. And uh, so if you're, wel you're welcome to any of the materials. Also, uh, there's plenty of materials at the bookseller now that might interest you in learning more and meeting my mission of enthusing people about Ericksonian approaches. So thank you so much for being such an important